Good morning, everybody. My name is Tom Cato. If you don't know me, we've been going through the book of Joshua, and it's been quite an extensive time. We've been following him through the book of Exodus, Deuteronomy, Numbers, just to see how this man developed. But we had we deviate from from things because there's questions that arise up with people. This morning, I want to begin with turning to the book of Ephesians. Uh, chapter 3 and beginning with verse 17. Ephesians chapter 3 beginning with verse 17. So that Christ may dwell in your hearts through faith that you being rooted and grounded in love may be able to comprehend with all the saints what is the breadth and length and height and depth and to know the love of Christ which surpasses knowledge and that you may be filled up to the fullness of God. Now this last expression to be filled up with the fullness of God I think it applies to a lot to what, but what the book of Joshua is about. Joshua was told to take the Israelites into the land of Canaan and for centuries God had reminded them of the land that he'd given to Abraham and Isaac and Jacob and Moses and snow now they're approaching the time to enter the land and so when they actually went into the land they fought many wars they conquered many enemies but in the end result they only really captured and took possession of about 10 to 12 percent of the land that God had promised them and what caused this well we got fat and happy with where we're at and we didn't grow much but the enemy was still there and so the story is the enemy is there and it's constantly at our throats it wants to have its way in our lives it wants to bring us down it wants to turn our hearts from God. It wants us to enjoy the pleasures of the world. And I'm, I'm not saying, you know, there isn't any enjoyment in it, but that it doesn't captivate us where we would miss church, watch football games, um, just sacrifice time of growing and knowing Christ. And so the fullness of him is what God really wants us to experience. And when we do, we come out of our shells. We're no longer hidden Christians. We're explosive Christians. We want to share the love of Jesus Christ and the gospel with, with everyone. So uh, uh, last week, or, the, or last week, the last time we met, we were going through uh, a certain part in Joshua. We, I had been going through Joshua from beginning with Exodus, showing all the little um, steps that he took in developing himself. And the Lord have, was preparing him for this time when he would take Israel into the land of Canaan. And so we went through, we've been through Exodus, um, Numbers, and now we're getting into the book of Deuteronomy. And as we read there, we read an incident about, about how God had instructed the, the, uh, the Israelites to destroy men, women, and children. And so we took a little detour there and, and, and uh, looked at that. Now... When uh, now the question has to be: Was God right in doing this? Was He just? Was He moral? And so when we we looked at it, we looked at God is immoral. He's a moral God. He's the one that instituted the law. He's the one that that gave truth to people and balance into people into how to care and love and and to treat each other. Um, it's sort of like when. When the Wild West was being discovered, and, and uh, I've had the pleasure to visit Tombstone, but there was uh, a lot of corruption. There was no law there, and there was killing, and there was gambling, and drinking, and prostitution, and uh, it was a mess. And so, obviously, God sent a man, man named Wyatt Earp to come in there, and he put his foot down. He told him no longer to bear weapons in there, and there was a fight over it. And it took some time and some lives. And yet he stood his ground and he began to institute law there. 
laws needed to keep people in check with their with their bad behavior and, and to promote good behavior and so that's you know that's the issues that we have to go through when we look at that at at this book in Joshua um, and so uh, I want to go to um, well let's just go back to back to the moral law of God um, so because because God instituted law then we we know right from wrong it's the only way that we have um, he brought the laws which were good for not only Israel but for all the world and the question was asked also is he just and righteous and coming to Abraham God was on his way to destroy Sodom and Gomorrah because their sins had risen up to him they were terribly corrupt and moral people and so he was on the verge of, of of destroying Sodom and Gomorrah and so he he comes across Abraham in the desert and he tells Abraham what he's going to do well Abraham's cousin Lot or nephew Lot is there and he knows he's there and so he goes so um, Abraham begins to negotiate with God and he asked him would you destroy it if there were 50 righteous men and God told him no I would not destroy it if there was 50 and then he goes down the line was was there 45 what if there was 45 I will not destroy it 30 I will not destroy it 20 I will not destroy it and finally he got down to 10 and God said I would not destroy it if there were 10 so obviously there was less than 10. So God sent his angelic beings in to save, save Lot and, and his family and they, he delivered them, but there were some situations that broke, broke out with his family. And so God, one of the things you have to see about God, he's long suffering with us, he's patient with us. And thank God for that. Thank God that he's merciful. And so we, we, he um, delivers them from that. But then the question is, uh, I think that most people don't understand the holiness of God. And, in, uh, and, and when God speaks to Moses in uh, Exodus, he, he tells Moses that he's not going to go into the promised land because when they were in the desert, he was, he was asked to one time speak to the rock or, or strike the rock and water came out to give water to the Israelites while they're in, in the desert, the wilderness. The second time, he tells them to speak to the rock because the rock speaks of Jesus Christ. The first time the rock was struck by, by Moses, it spoke of God, God's judgment on him. He took, the, he took the judgment for us. The second time, he's alive. And so we only need to speak to him now. And so Moses was angry with the group. He struck the rock, and, and that changed a little bit of uh, Moses' plan to taking the people into Israel. God said that you, you defamed my name. You, you, uh, you made my name as though it was unholy. And I don't believe that we all understand the holiness of God. If we understood it, we'd certainly be walking in it in, in the way that would please and honor him. Um... Uh, the second thought is, this is God's world. He created it. He created to have relationship with man. Then in the in the, the Garden of Eden, when Adam and Eve were there, um, he told them that they could eat of all the fruit of the, the land except this one tree in the center of the garden. He said that do not take of it, for the minute you eat of it, you'll die. Well, there was an enemy there and spoke to Eve and told her that God was just trying to uh, not allow them to become like him, wise in all his knowledge. And so um, she, they looked at the fruit and said, come on, you think God's gonna, really going to have you die if you eat this fruit? Look at it. It's tasty. And so she took of it and ate, ate of it and threw her. And then Adam, of course, came along and had some sin in the world. And so we became corrupted at that time. We became self-centered and not thinking of God. 
And so in, in the garden, it was the beginning of light and darkness. It is when, when Satan uh, fell from God, he became dark. He became God's uh, uh, enemy and has worked in this world since that time. Um, the thing about God is he's sovereign. Again, this is his creation. He has expectations for us to behave in his creation. And we, the only way we can know it is through reading his word. When we talk about God's sovereignty, that means he's, he rules over everything. The outer space, the planets, earth, and all the things that go on on the earth. I'd like to read what Paul said when he entered, when he entered Athens and he had passed through and looking at the different gods they had and he came across to uh, a, an inscription that said to the unknown God in Ephesians chapter 17, verse 23. Now I was going along and carefully looking at your objects of worship. I came to an altar with the inscriptions to the unknown God. God, who created the world and everything in it, since he is Lord of heaven and earth, does not dwell in temples made with hands, nor is he served by human hands as though he needed anything, because he who gives to all people life and breath and all things. He made for one man every nation of mankind to live on the face of the earth, having determined their appointed times and boundaries of their lands and territories. This was, this was so that they would seek God and perhaps find that they might feel for him and find him, though he's not far from each one of us. For in him we live and move and exist and it is him who actually has our being and so God is really in control of, of every detail he's ever chose he chose our parents he chose the place that we lived and uh, and so he um, this is what his desire is but now he commands that all people everywhere repent this is to change the old way of thinking to regret their past sins to seek God's purpose for their lives because he has set a day when he will judge the inhabited world in righteousness by a man whom he appointed and destined for that task. He has provided credible proof to everyone by raising him from the dead. And this man is the Lord Jesus Christ who conquered sin, death, and judgment, and the grave. He's, he's, he's risen. And... and um, so we, we have uh, the, the thoughts too is, is that God is long suffering with mankind. We have the, the incident with, uh, with Abraham. Uh, with Noah. Took, sorry, I blanked out. With Noah. Noah was asked to build an ark. And for 120 years, he. he um, he worked on this ark and people would come by and, and laugh at it and mock what what's what do you need that big boat for because there's no water here and uh, and Moses ke or, and Noah kept on saying that he was going to judge the God was going to judge the earth and finally that day happened and so only eight souls go into the ark and only eight souls are saved and God shut the ark and rain came from down from heaven but it also came from the earth. It gushed out of the earth. And so for 120 years, Mo, uh, again, Noah had preached the gospel for 120 years. Did people listen? No, only eight moved in. Then you have the incident with Abraham when, when destroying uh, Sodom and Gomorrah. God had beforehand had men in that land of Canaan. Abraham was in Canaan. Jacob was in Canaan, Isaac was in Cape Canaan, and, and even in the days of Abraham, there was a man called Melchizedek, who also was in that kingdom, who was known to be the king of righteousness and peace. And so God had messengers there. He has messages all the time. He wishes for no one to perish. And so that's the issue. 
God will, will make himself known to people throughout the world. Even today, we talked about it before in Iran, there, is a, there are people coming to know Jesus Christ in Iran because they don't like their government, their, their theocracy that they have, because it only takes care of their military and only the rich, the governmental rich, and they're left with nothing. And so God has placed the gospel there. People are having visions there, and they're coming to Christ there. So God's work is always going on. He wishes for no man to perish. And so with, with that, you know, God is a moral God. He's right. He is righteous in what he judges our, our men. He wants to know us to know the truth, that he exists. But he's holy. He's righteous. He's, he's uh, omnipotent. He's all power. He's sovereign over all things. God loves man. He created him in the, in the, in the garden to have relationship with us. And the only way we can have relationship with him is with, through Jesus Christ, his son. And so I want to I leave that now and go to the... Uh, let me find my notes. I want to go back to Deuteronomy 138 because we... We began, this is the last book that talks about Joshua before he goes into, um, before he goes into the promised land. And all these years, God's been bu building this man. He's, he's been discipled by Moses. He's been there with Moses since his youth. And so in Deuteronomy, I believe 138 is, is the passage that we're going to look at. And just a, a verse there. Joshua 138 Joshua the son of Nun who stands before you he shall enter there encourage him for he shall cause Israel to inherit it now he's talking to Moses Moses job was to, to let him know that he wasn't going into the promised land Moses knew he wasn't going into the promised land and, uh, and so he was preparing Joshua Joshua had been with Moses the first time he was in the war uh, against Amalek right after they got out of the, set free from Egypt had crossed the Jordan and for a few days they were fine and all of it all of a sudden an enemy called Amalek came and, and attacked him and he defeated him defeated him there because God was going to lead his people in, in the, into the promised land nothing was going to stop God from leading them but the only people that can stop God is us and our hearts. The lack of, 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 of being faithful to him. The lack of uh, disobedience to him and his word. And so, um, so here we have him that he shall be encouraged. So Moses began to encourage him, began to remind him. And no doubt Joshua had been, he was up on the mount when Moses was receiving the tablet. He'd seen the, the, the light and the fire going on in the mountain. I'm not sure if he heard what God was saying, but, but he certainly knew that God, there was something going on on that mountain. He came down from that mountain um, and, and was, uh, um, went, because they had heard of reverie going on in, in the, with the people. They had built a false idol and how fickle we are you know, in a short time, we enjoy the greatness and, and beauties of God, and all of a sudden, we turn our backs on God. Um, the next verse is in uh, is verse. Um, Well, we read verse 38, but I, I wanted to deviate from that because God said that he was, that he would be there with him. And just in his, as an example, I want to read what Rahab from Joshua, the book of Joshua said 